Welcome to Overcritical, a show where we take a deep dive into movies, TV, and video games from a critical leftist perspective. Uh, today we have on a special guest, Aaron Thorpe. Uh, he is the co-host of a couple other podcasts you may be familiar with, uh, like the Trillbillies, Everybody Loves Communism, uh, and then occasionally uh, Struggle Session, which is uh, kind of similar to what we do here at Overcritical. Um, so thank you very much for coming on. Thank you so much, Parker, for having me. Uh... Uh, we were talking earlier, and uh, this has been like, uh, I won't say a long time coming, but it's been like a few weeks where uh, just schedules and whatnot. So I'm finally happy to like uh, be on and talk to you about the stuff. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, and uh, so today we are going to be looking at um, Ready Player One. Um, what um, spurred me to uh, reach out to you, Aaron, was this article on your Substack, uh, spacelight.substack.com, uh, called um, What May Have Been, uh, Retroism, Nostalgia, and Futurelessness. And um, just aside from uh, it just being a really good piece um, Thank you. on those topics, it really reminded me of a lot of the, um, just the way that Ready Player One, the movie and the book, really leans on a lot of references to past pop culture mm -hmm. to sort of like um just fill out the texture of it all and um in my opinion just to sort of give viewers like a whole bunch of chances to like point at the screen and go like oh i recognize that you know <laughs> yeah just easter like eggs the, yeah while i still thought that it was a decent movie like it was fun um that sort of um what i consider like corporate nostalgia-ish um, really still kind of rubbed me in a strange way. So I wanted to bring you on just to kind of uh, speak about the movie from that angle, about your piece here in Substack. Um, and I guess we can uh, start with what uh, you thought about the movie. Um, I know you said you rewatched it recently. Um, well, when was the first time you saw it? Um, I think the first time I saw it was like at least a couple months ago. I'm not sure exactly when, but... Um... I don't remember if I decided to watch it because um, there's this book that I'll be referencing because um, I referenced it in my piece called The Circle of the Snake. Um, I think it's Nostalgia and Big Tech is like the subtitle. And um, it's by Grafton Tanner where he talks about retroism um, in terms of, uh, you know, our culture, our media. And he mentions Ready Player One um, because, I mean, for those who probably don't know, um, it's a adaptation of a book written by... Or, or uh orson scott what no it's not who is it written by uh ernest klein or er, um, yeah ernest klein okay yeah. so uh basically it's a dystopian um future where people can escape into a sort of metaverse which i guess wasn't i mean that wasn't a word or a concept at the time but it kind of is yeah. a metaverse right yeah yeah like i couldn't stop thinking about like oh my god this is probably exactly what Mark Zuckerberg and his ilk were thinking of when they were trying to <laughs> make the metaverse a thing. Yeah, exactly, but exactly. It, it was not a thing when this movie released. I think it was 2018. 2018, so. yeah. And the book was yeah. written even way before that. So um, mm -hmm. it was mentioned in the Cir Circle of the Snake. And um, I mean, I like, I like, uh, obviously, if anybody like kind of follows me online and stuff, I'm really into media, but... Um, I mean, I don't game, but I mean, just kind of like that 90s or even though I was born in 1990, even 80s sort of culture of video games and fiction and movies and whatnot. And, you know, I mean, even maybe music, you know, um, depending. So uh, when I saw it, um, I I got the same reaction that you did where you are kind of um, there's this nostalgia machine, you know, so mm -hmm. that's the thing that's going to kind of um, entice you. Right. Um, it's very, it's, it's sort of like what Picard, um, I don't know if there are any Trekkies out there, if you're a Trekkie yourself, Parker, but, uh, Picard, um, which is the, uh, Star Trek series featuring, uh, Patrick Stewart reprising his role as John Luke Picard, the newest, the newest and last season that's about to come out, actually the last season, they're bringing back all of the classic TNG characters, you know, hmm. They're bringing back Dr. Beverly Crusher. They're bringing back Worf. Um, Data is dead, I guess, in this in this timeline. Yeah. Um, and they're bringing back a couple other people. I think um, uh, Troy as well. Deanna Troy as well. Riker. And <clears throat> even though I hate that fucking... 
I kind of hate that show. <laughs> like, I'm going to, like, you know, as Trump said, like, I'm going to keep drinking that slop because of nostalgia, right? So, like, mm-hmm. I, but I got rubbed the wrong way, as you're saying, because it does definitely feel um, like a, like a, like a real, like an easy trick, I guess, you know? And, I mean, we'll talk about it, but there are also some sort of, po- there are also the politics of the film and the way it ends, especially. That rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah. You know, because, uh, I mean, I'll just say it now because, and we'll, we'll talk through it, but I guess at the end, it's this idea that, you know, as they said, this dystopian society, but there's this mega corporation or this individual, right, um, who has power, who has all this power, right, um, of this metaverse. And in a Willy, in a Willy Wonka, Charlie, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, in a Willy Wonka kind of way, there is a, the inventor of this who sort of leaves like a golden ticket, right? Mm-hmm. And once you find it as a player, and this leads to the events of the movie, you find it as a player, and this is what uh, you get to become the new controller, I guess, of this, right? But that's problematic, you know? Because that's like, it's just a, you know what I mean? That's what bothers yeah. me again. I'm rambling, but yeah. that's what really, that's like the one thing that stuck me at the end. So as you said, the kind of nostalgia thing that's just kind of to grab you in the politics of it, right? Yeah, um, I can see how, like, Ernest Klein and then whoever um, uh, worked on adapting that to the film um, weren't really concerned about uh, the politics of how of this course. looks. Yeah. But, like, it, it, I'm really surprised that more thought wasn't given to that because, like, just the start of the, like, the premise itself, it seems pretty, like political like on its face already like um there's uh the real world is um just really drab it's dying um yeah. our... it's almost like post post climate change almost it seems right or not mm-hmm. even post like you know what i mean like it's yeah yeah been ravaged but society's been ravaged by climate change almost it seems yeah yeah like the main character wade um in his opening monologue i uh i wrote it down like he references um the corn syrup droughts and like the bandwidth riots which are like Mm. supposed to be like riffs on like what could actually happen you know like corn syrup like we like shove corn syrup into everything and now we don't have it yeah and we're all panicking we got that and then oh we're all addicted to the internet so the bandwidth riots we can't get on the internet um and like there's supposed to be riffs on like like major natural disasters that could happen in the future um but like the the world itself is really shitty. It takes place, uh, most of the movie takes place in like this favela that Columbus, Ohio has been turned into. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, which I found a bit weird. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say, isn't it, isn't it interesting? Uh, it, I mean, isn't it interesting just making me think that, um, I mean, you know, I guess maybe that's problematic for me, but it always seems like in these movies, like me as an American viewer, like the slums, it always, they always make it look as if, it's some foreign country, right? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, to make you kind of, like, recognize it, you know, as mm-hmm. if we don't have slums in America and the United States. But, yeah, I know what you're saying. It's very, it's very of a favela kind of look to it, right? Yeah. Um, like, exactly. Like you said, like, uh, America has plenty of, like, really poor and downtrodden places that you can crib. Um, they like, could film that shit in Detroit, man. From. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know. But since, like, like, the, like, view of a favela in some like like horrible south american country you know like that's yeah. instantly recognizable to us um yeah, yeah. that's that how it looks um yeah so there is a lot to unpack with the unaddressed politics of the film um and i guess uh we can speak about that um but like uh what i really kept getting struck by were those like um that nonstop barrage of references that you see um it's in every frame and what i actually started realizing is that like this movie uh is uh or was uh distributed by uh warner bros which um uh, was not at the time but is now kind of um uh, going through a little bit of a shit show uh, with the merger with Discovery happening. Um, and uh, so many of the uh, the references and stuff are Warner Bros. properties. 
Um, and um, which I'll be honest, I kind of uh, not to catch you up, but just real quick, I kind of that was kind of the guilty pleasure in me because I love yeah. DC Comics, you know. Yeah. So DC Comics is owned by Warner Brothers, so mm-hmm. I got to see Batman and Superman and the Joker and Harley Quinn, and I mean, like, and they know that, you know, mm-hmm. they know uh, that shit. Yeah. Um, like I just found that interesting because um it like it made me think like if this had been distributed by like another movie company like what sort of references would have been stuck in there yeah um and like uh, like obviously not everything is a uh, warner bros thing um like one of the first ones that i recognized was minecraft like in the intro um yeah. whatever and that's just owned by microsoft but yeah so um I guess um, overall, I did enjoy the movie for just just what it is. Mm-hmm. You know, like I was eating that slop. It was a fun adventure thing, yeah. um, but uh, I still just couldn't get past the um, aesthetics and the politics of it. Um, so I guess um, I wanted to hear more of your thoughts on um, just what like how something like ready player one um just fits within what you were speaking about um Mm. in your substack piece uh yeah um this whole thing uh with uh nostalgia is Mm. really about um escapism and um that is explicitly said in the movie uh like what the oasis is it's an escape for people and uh, we can, like, we can talk about why mm-hmm. uh, the escape for people is a bunch of references from the '80s, even though the film takes place in 2047. But <laughs> yeah. that's another thing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So um, what in the piece? Um, the reason why I kind of wrote the piece to the background, I guess, is that um, I I like Mark Fisher a lot, and um, I had only ever read um, Capitalist Realism, and he also wrote a book called Ghost of My Life. Um, about hauntology and lost features, and um, never heard the word hauntology before. Um, had never heard um the work of uh Derda, I think it is, um, who actually coined the term. And um, even though I hadn't read kind of the uh seminal text to sort of understand the concept, Mark Fisher, um, does a really good job um of describing this sort of socio political, I guess, phenomenon. Um, and especially how it is a feature of um, late stage capitalism or neoliberalism, I guess, right? And um, basically, ontology is sort of, I mean, kind of to give a kind of give a historical context to it. I guess in the uh, late seventies to early eighties, um, and then you know up until the nineties, you had the you know manufactured engineered collapse of the Soviet Union, right? And when the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 90s, um, you you basically have what is uh, uh, what is this, uh, uh, how else to say, uh, this neoliberalism, which is now the dominant sort of, the same way the United States is unipolar, neoliberalism, which through globalization, through financialization, um, through, uh, through austerity, has sort of wrapped its like tentacle like arms around the world right and as margaret thatcher said there's no alternative right so right yeah like it was the end of history exactly as fukuyama says it's the end of history right so um kind of not it's not a novel theory of mine and obviously fisher talks about it and frederick jameson talks about it when he critiques postmodernism. but essentially um i think what you see in the what you see in the 2000s this kind of culmination right um i think 9 11 the thing, the three events I think of are 9/11, um, the war in Iraq, and also uh, the uh, uh, 9/11, the war in Iraq, and the financial crash. I guess right. Um, but then there are other attributes, right? Um, such as this, the digitization of everything, right? This interconnected world that we're all now living in, right? Where even before, even social media, but just even cell phones, right? The internet and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think uh, Grafton Tanner calls it pre-recession nostalgia. And what I think it is is that, you know, hauntology is sort of about what may have been, you know, or what is what is what yet exists, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, in the piece, 
I talk about it in political terms, in terms of the Democratic Party. You know, the Democratic Party is haunted by um, the New Deal, right? Um, which that coalition um, fell apart at the same time neoliberalism, right, starts to rise. Um, haunted by the civil rights movement, right? They're haunted by this party that, while it was never perfect or was never completely amenable to um, the left, this party that was at least influenced by, um, like, actual politics, right, or organizations, right, and people on the ground, mass politics, I should say, right? And I think autology is kind of being haunted by what could have been, as I said, right, or what existed, you know? I think since the fall of the Soviet Union, um, or this, en- I keep saying fall, but I'm going to say, like, kind of engineered collapse, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think what you had was this sort of futurelessness that starts to creep in, you know? Um, and I think that there's this despair and I think that especially, you know, young people now who, I mean, Gorbachev died, you know, just the other yeah. day. And, you know, on my timeline, you know, and in, um, on Twitter, I'm seeing a lot of people who are, um, you know, saying rest and piss. Right. And like, you know, being really happy about it. And I mean, that's great, because what that says to me is that these are this is a generation that doesn't have much of a future. And there's this lost future. Right. In the Soviet mm-hmm. Union. Right. Almost like a what if, you know. So, again, I think kind of bring it back, um, you know, with hauntology is not even our politics are haunted, right? Where, where uh, as Mark Fisher says, capitalism is not haunted by the specter of communism, but by its disappearance. This manifests in our media, you know, and I think Ready Player One in our culture. And I think Ready Player One is a perfect example of that. I think mm-hmm. something like Stranger Things is a perfect example of that. I think even something like Drive, you know, that Ryan Gosling movie, which is a is is set in the modern day but it's almost timeless or kind of an 80s sort of um kind of uh, uh, i guess uh i don't know how else to put it like aura to it you know what i mean um and i think like that's that's because ready player one especially is like you know people want to slip back into nostalgia if that means the days of their childhood right or um the way something made them feel because nostalgia kind of come it comes from the root i think the latin root which means home you know so like nostalgia is like it's home for people you know and Mm -hmm. i think you know during times of economic um crisis or social crisis or uneasiness um a movie like ready player one which was like i mean they're just easter eggs as you were saying earlier they're just easter eggs sprinkled throughout the movie i mean in every single frame you know um and I mean, I guarantee you were talking. You made me think earlier. You were talking about um, if another property had done this, and I, I, I bet that Disney wishes is trying to come up with something oh, yeah. like Ready Player One, right? To oh, put yeah. all of their characters um, from all of these different universes into one movie. And one thing, one last thing, I want to mention, um, and kind of back to related to hauntology, um, is that I think like. And Ready Player One is that Grafton Tanner in the Circle of the Snake. He talks about um, fandom. You know, he has a whole chapter on that yeah. and um, kind of fan lore. And um, you know, like this is fan fiction. You know, this is like you know people arguing on Twitter or old school message boards um, about like their favorite iteration of the character. And Ready Player One is like, I mean, it's just like. I mean, it's like straight pornography for fans, right? Yeah. You know, um, and again, you know, back to the hauntology thing, just kind of tie that in. I do think that um, even with the music in the film, right, the film is not only taking you back into the 80s, right, as a sort of um, seeing all your favorite um, intellectual properties, but the music that is used too, right? I think there are some elements of the film, aesthetics of it, that are also hauntological, you know, that sort of have this hearkening back to the past, you know. I don't know how I don't know how else to describe it, but again, like something like um Stranger Things does that a lot, you know. Um, where in every single scene it tries to recreate the eighties. And um, you know, I'm rambling now, but I mean that's what that's what that's what like I was so interested to talk to you with you about this because um Again, Grafton Tanner talks about it in his book, but it's until you as like I'm sure the age that both of you and not you and I are, when you're actually watching it and it's no longer like a theoretical thing that you're reading on a page, right? 
It's like the way that you understand that industry and capital is consciously putting these elements together and producing this movie that you consume as a way to like escape to the past, you know, and how insidious that is. Right. And that's why the movie, I think both of us feel that uneasiness, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it like the explosion of 80s nostalgia media over the past um, almost decade now, really. It's been like 20, yeah, almost like 20 years, 15, 20 years, right? Yeah. Um, realistically, it's explained just by people who grew up in the 80s now becoming artists and creators, and they mm-hmm. kind of want to put their own lives into their work. And so that's kind of why we're seeing it. Uh, but like the reason it's so successful in the first place, you know, like, um, like, Stranger Things could have been made in the early 2000s, maybe. But like, it may not have been quite as successful if it didn't hit when it did. Um, and uh, yeah, like I think it, um, it really does show the thirst for, um, like for that era in time. Something that felt um, a bit more economically uh, secure um, mm-hmm. uh, and... Um, there was still a future to look forward to, you know, like it was more predictable 80s. as well. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and like, that is a bit of, a um, uh, like, especially a like white centric view too. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but like, uh, ready player one really is that perfect distillation of that sort of nostalgia. It makes that nostalgia, the entire world of the story um uh the people who live in the in the world of ready player one are um are living that sort of nostalgia every single day like it's how their economy works it's how the world um is interacted with i mean it's even a social so sorry to drop but it's even in the game the game even reproduces like a social hierarchy based on what you owned, right? Yeah, yeah. And like these, the things that you own, like, are you like people? I mean, I guess there's, I forget what, I forget what the character's name is. There's a scene where, um, where I think he, he sees like, uh, a, a replica of the Millennium, the Millennium Falcon, you know? And mm-hmm. like all this old, all this old shit that he's just in love with, you know? And like, you can buy that stuff in the metaverse, right? Or mm-hmm. in Oasis, right? You can buy that stuff and that's like uh, conspicuous consumerism, right? It mm-hmm. signifies and denotes your class, right? Like your class, essentially. I mean, even though everybody in there is fucking like poor, right? You know, it's then right, it's a, yeah. a dystopian society, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, that really is, I think, uh, to me, the most frustrating thing about Ready Player One is that it it ends up running into so many things where it could actually make some sort of statement, some sort of message, you know, like mm-hmm. how, how this intensely creative thing, the Oasis eventually just got turned into another way for capitalism to exert its power. Um, how the way that this whole issue of the world being run by um, this system and by the mega corporations who are trying to take control of it, how it ends up in the hands of one person, you know, like, um, and how that's like also kind of a bad thing. Cause like, you don't, like you don't want to run into like that whole great man theory, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and it just, it, it sidesteps all that and just, just focuses on the real surface level of it. And it distracts you with all those references on screen and stuff. And so um, it's only when you really think about it, like now <laughs> that, that you're going like, hang on, that's actually kind of fucked up. Like what happened here? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yo, that, that's such a good point, exactly, because, like, and I think that's what, like, you know, just, like, kind of really bothered me, because the world that they're living in, right, is, like, you know, instead of, I mean, if I, at the end of the movie, if I got the key to, you know, controlling Oasis, I would destroy it, right? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, he, I think, like, they dem- try to democratize it or something, basically, right? Is that what it is? Or do, do they turn it off? They kind of take the middle route, and they uh they decide to um close it close it, like, close it twice close yeah. it twice a week that's what they right do. yeah like twice a week uh 
It's like the whole like boomer thing of like, uh, we're going to have family Sundays or something, you know? Exactly. Yeah. We're going to have, you're only going to have like four hours of TV <laughs> exactly. a week and some shit like that. It's like motherfucker. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm going to sneak away. I'm going to find out a way to like watch that shit. You know what I'm saying? Or like, you know what I mean? Play video games after dark, but like it's, yeah, exactly. It's like, yo, instead of just destroying completely. Right. You know, and actually like, you know, returning back to the real world, like touching grass. <laughs> yeah. Right. And like making the real world better. Um, it's this idea that like, um, and you know, cause nostalgia, nostalgia can be a good thing. Right. right. Like, I think yeah. like, especially, especially on the left, I think that like, I talk, I don't talk about enough in the piece, but towards the end of the piece, um, you know, to talk about like the sort of radical, um, nostalgia, right. Like, which is like remembering, um, you know, uh, uh, revolutions and independence movements mm-hmm. and just resistance, right. Of the yesteryear of like, you know, our comrades past, but I think like, you know, the, 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 the problem is like not being able to imagine a better future. Mm-hmm. And that's like a big thing, futurelessness. And I think like, you know, that is the problem like with the film, right. It's like in this futureless future, you know, and again, you know, I know I got to turn off the political part of my brain when I watch <laughs> some of this stuff, right? But like, right. you know, if the whole point, the whole point is that people are, ex- well, I don't want to say subjugated, right? And made to be passive, right? It's like, it's a spectacle is what it is. It's kind of like the Debordian spectacle, right? It's like meant to make you passive. And if that's like clear in the movie and kind of motivates all of the plot, all of the, you know, events in the movie, then... Why not destroy it at the end, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, I do agree with you there. Uh, like, nostalgia isn't inherently a bad thing um, mm-hmm. from a political perspective to a, an entertainment perspective. Like, it does have value. It's really fun to go back and revisit things that you haven't seen in a whole lot. Um, but like in this movie, it can really be used to just kind of uh, just provide that sort of escape and um, that... Uh, distraction of like wow times are really good then instead of um, using those memories to push forward to make that future out of this futureless present that we live in and um, yeah the ending really was another cop-out in that way you know like it wasn't like they didn't want to make that really hard decision like either really either way uh so they were like yeah we'll kind of like we'll shut it down every tuesday and thursday you know like <laughs> exactly yeah like like it's a local restaurant or something and the owner just doesn't want to like <laughs> yeah. run it on a couple days a week yeah 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 or like or like it's like you know like a an mm mmorpg or like a you know like a first person shooter online first person shooter that needs maintenance right know, like twice a week. <laughs> right scheduled catch, right? maintenance yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it, you know, another thing you were making me think about, too, that you had mentioned, um, you know, and, um, and I probably should have another thing I could talk about more, um, should have talked about more in the piece or maybe in another piece is like, you know, the way nostalgia like is whitewash, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, like literally like kind of like, you know, um, the past, obviously, if it's remembered differently by everybody, you know, so like, you know, even if um, you enjoy a certain time or a piece of media, you know, just thinking about power dynamics at the time, right? Like, what position were black people in? What position were women in? What position were LGBTQ people in, right? And it's like, it's, I think, I mean, this is kind of like something that's been talked about, um, you know, since 2015, and I don't want to get too much into it, but like, you know, Trump's slogan, Make America Great Again, is not, it's not even something that's unique to like the conservatives, mm-hmm. right? And having this, this idea of this idyllic past with this neat racial, um, you know, um, sexist um, social hierarchy, you know, and the economic hierarchy. I mean, Biden also and other Democrats also appeal to even Bernie, right, mm-hmm. has appealed to this idea of make America great again as if, you know, there was ever a point in which this country was like great <laughs> right. as a qualitative term, yeah. right, you know. But like even Bernie, you know, Biden, of course, like, well, we got to um, bring everything back to normalcy, right, you know, the Obama days, mm-hmm. right. And then Bernie is hearkening back even further, which, sure, dude, like, I would like him to be the next FDR. Sure, I would like a sort of new new deal. But, I mean, at the same time, um, the Federal Housing Act, right, which is basically the 
foundation of creation of like suburbs in the United States, um, you had black soldiers, GIs that were left out mm-hmm. of that, you know? So, I mean, even like, you know, certain New Deal programs, social programs, black people were excluded from them. So, I mean, even if I, and that's not a nitpicky thing, but if I wanted to be nitpicky, right, I could say that, hey, like, that wasn't a great time for everybody, mm-hmm. right? So, like, nostalgia definitely is like, you know, this very insidious thing. Like, you know, I was, I'll tell you some funny, I was watching, um, I love, I, again, I love Trek, and I was watching them. I think every podcast I go on since I've become a Trekkie, <laughs> like I make a Trek <laughs> reference, at least like one Trek reference, man. This is the second one I think I've said, but um, I mentioned Picard. But this, so I love TNG again, um, and I was watching it. It's the first time I was watching it, the first season, awful. And, dude, there's this, there's this fucking episode, man. I cannot remember the name of it. It is, it's, this show came out in 19, no, this show came out in the uh, late 80s, like mid to late 80s, right? Yeah, so yeah, run that. This is like late 80s, this is like late 80s season one, right? And dog, there's this episode, man, where Tasha Yar, I think it is, she's a crew member, she's a chief of security or whatever, and she gets kidnapped by the this alien yes, race. Yes, yeah, I know what you're talking which, about. Bro, alien race, which I mean, they're aliens, but they're black people. They're black <laughs> actors. No makeup. Not like the Klingons, dog. No, With the Klingons, yeah. they hire a lot of black actors, which is even problematic, right. but whatever, right? Oh, Ferengi, don't even don't even get me started, right? But so it's just these like literally like like they look like 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 birth of a nation yeah. DW Griffith <laughs> type kidnapping this white woman, taking her back to the planet. Yeah. And dog, like everybody that's involved in that shit at the time. Like Patrick Stewart, who is like a socialist, mm-hmm. right? He said he's a socialist. Like I'm sure, like um, Cole Meany. I don't know if he was. I don't know if he was in that. Ep- no, he wasn't in that episode. But anyway, I'm saying like at the time, you would have thought, right, that people would have been like, "God damn, this is hella racist, right. bro." And I'm watching, <laughs> and I love TNG because it's like it's dude. That's even before I was like right before I was born. Mm-hmm. I was a little kid, but it makes me nostalgic, right? So I guess my point is saying that like, you know, even if I want to be nostalgic. For the 90s, right? You know, uh, outside of just Trek, right? Which I am. I love, like, the 90s bulls, man. I love, like, um, just just sort of, I, I guess, the aesthetic of the mm-hmm. 90s, you know? Um, people know I love retro sci-fi art. And even then, I'm like, damn, man. The, like, black people at the time, too. Even, like, then, I mean, obviously, Rodney King, right? right yeah. I mean, it just wasn't... I mean, the nostalgia is tricky because... There's never really been, there's never been a good time for, or a golden age for everybody in this country. For sure, for some people, obviously, right? We know who, but it's, it's insidious, right? Is my point, you know? Yeah. Um, and like that whole conversation of, um, like how nostalgia on its face is like a purely positive thing. Like it's about making an era seem like, like the best thing ever, like those were the golden days, you know, and like f- for everyone, every, like every decade is the golden days, you know? Um, and, um, and it's what, um, uh, ready player one leans so heavily on. Uh, but, um, there's this, there's this video on YouTube. I watched a while ago. I cannot remember who, uh, who did it, but I'll make sure to go back and look for it so I can have it in the show notes. But um, it, it, it was about um, comparing and contrasting um, the way Stranger Things portrays the 80s and how it, the movie, uh, portrays the 80s. Ooh, this sounds good. I would love, I would love, to, I would love, when, yeah, when we, I would love to check this out. Like, after we get off, send it to me because I would love to check yeah, it out. Yeah, yeah, like, it was a really good um, point of discussion is how, Stranger Things has this really rose tinted view of uh of the eighties. Um, how like like yeah, like our main characters get bullied, but like it's never really anything serious and like mm-hmm. there's the music, they get to dress up as like Ghostbusters for Halloween because that was like the cool it thing right then for like nerd culture. Uh but then with it, um like you have our main characters get like ruthlessly bullied, like straight up, like almost murdered at a couple times by the other (laughs) human characters um, who those bullies themselves are going through some deep personal trauma shit of their own, you know, like with the, um, with the kid who has the abusive dad Mm -hmm. um, 
girl character whose name I cannot remember, uh, who also has like a like sexually abusive dad too. Uh, yes, just yes. like everyone has their own fucked up shit uh, because like that's like that's how it was, you know. Like it wasn't all like. Ghostbusters and Duran Duran, you know, like it was, uh, yeah, like and big hair, like right, I mean, yeah, shit yeah, was like it was real fucking life, you know. And I get, and I get, like obviously these are two different approaches to just like 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 genre, right? But you're absolutely right because like, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Actually, go ahead, continue, continue, because I'm cutting you off. Oh no, 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 no. Um, uh, the main uh point that I um I I remembered from that video that. I again really found applicable to Ready Player One is that um, it really takes the former approach, you know, the Stranger Things approach, and um, it only views um, th- like the good times in that really positive light, and specifically just through pop culture. There's no, um, there's really no uh, nostalgia for um, like anything else of the 80s you know like there's no nostalgia for um like the like the looks of the 80s really um there's no nostalgia for the mountains of cocaine everyone was on back then <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. um, it's 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 all about um what like what movies came out what characters and other franchises spawned out of uh the other intellectual properties that got influenced by those things like it's all viewed through just uh what sort of pop culture was manufactured there and not through anything um like i guess more tangible i guess is the right word like yeah. like pop culture is still like super important there are a lot of like really important uh, uh films and tv shows that definitely have their place in um in an examination of a time period but like um like there were like real people who did real shit like you mentioned rodney king the other day like he was a huge yes. part of that era um exactly and obviously a movie like ready player one isn't going to reference rodney king uh, but, exactly yeah. <laughs> exactly but but like you know you're, you're making me think too like how um you know like like culture at the end of the piece that i wrote um because i spent i spent like you know, like, I don't know, like a week or so writing this piece, you know, I read this book and um, I had no prescriptions for how to deal with futurelessness, how to deal with um, this culture of recursion, Grafton Tanner calls mm-hmm. it, where it's uh, re- repetition. We're seeing remakes and reboots, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and um, prequels even, what I would include in that, right? And, um, you know, how do we... Like, how do we get out of that, right? How do we snap out of that? And I found this piece by um, uh, Marxist uh, theorist Stuart Hall. And it's called uh, uh, Deconstructing the Popular. Um, I think it's what it's called. I think that's the full name. And the piece is basically about um, how on the left, I guess these are my words, but I think on the left, um, we have a tendency to um, look down on popular culture you know or mass culture i guess we would say um because you know in a kind of gramscian sort of um analysis i guess um you know it's cultural hegemony you Mm -hmm. know um it's it's besides like you know the police beating the shit out of you it's like uh uh, culture is how the ruling class um disseminates ideas Mm -hmm. right um but Stuart hall says that you know people can take from can watch something and take from a piece of media um things that feel true to their own lives you know yeah. or or things that are false um things that are pandering to them right like people aren't stupid you know i think this is why obviously why like you know people like certain representations or depictions of the past and other people don't um i think that like maybe Maybe this is not a great example, but I'm thinking about it as I'm talking. Euphoria. I've never seen this fucking show. Yeah. But this show, I know, has created some debates online, I remember, because people were like, yo, are kids really doing that mm-hmm. in school now? Like, I didn't fucking do that in school. Like, it seems that this 
show reminds me of like a sort of kids. I don't know if anyone's ever seen that movie. It's really hard to watch, but this 19 early 90s film, I think Rosario Rosario Dawson's first mm-hmm. role, and there're probably a bunch of other actors in there who went on to great do great big things. But it's about these kids that like um get fucked up and party all the time and do awful things to one another, right? And themselves. And you know, I think that like when people try to remember like the past you know um they end up or watch a piece of media but maybe talk about the past again specifically i think people like to put in things that you know the things that they recognize things that are familiar mm-hmm. to them you know like they don't have this over sort of overarching perspective of like what the past really was and um God, I forgot what I was saying about um. God, I've talked myself into a circle. Sorry, <laughs> no worries. Um, well, like it's like how yeah. um how people like I don't know the exact saying, uh, but the gist of it is that um uh people won't remember what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Exactly. Yes. 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 And, yes. Yes. Um, that's a great. That's a great quote. And so, in all these pieces of media that are fueled by nostalgia, um you either get like the stranger things that are motivated by like the really fun times and the cool aesthetics or motivated by the really bad shit that they remember from uh, that era. And that's when you get the it's and all that other stuff. Um, And um, yeah. And so like with something like euphoria, um, I, I graduated high school in 2012. Um, uh, I was, born in 94 so like i'm not a a gen zer mm-hmm. but like i'm on the tail end of the millennial uh yeah. era um and uh well i definitely wasn't um the uh, uh a, a party kid by any means i'm pretty <laughs> sure nobody uh was doing the kind or well not nobody but not as many people as euphoria makes it out to be uh Exactly. I, like, I think the same. And I know it depends yeah. on where you grew up and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But I feel like it's a very, it's a show that's a very 90s, 80s type of almost like reminiscent of satanic panic. Your kids are going to go out and listen to rock and roll and do drugs right. type of yeah. shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like every, like every character is involved in like the worst shit imaginable. Like, like, exactly. um, uh, uh, there's one high school age girl that um, like is a cam girl. There's another who mm-hmm. gets into like serious drug dealing, and yeah, like you get uh, a show like Euphoria that becomes insanely popular in the cultural zeitgeist, and then it, it eventually reaches people who grew up before that time who are now. Is this what the kids are doing? And of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not. Yeah, it's just like the high highs and the low lows, um, and um, and. So again, like that's what a movie like Ready Player One really leads into. It's it's driven by that like that one guy, the messianic figure of Halliday, who created the Oasis, and what he grew up in was the '80s, and so that's like like he kind of infused the whole world with his brand of nostalgia that now everyone is um, is just like drinking from. Um, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And and you you know what to. Um... Oh, I remember now as you were talking, I remember because you touched on something, too, is like, you know, like uh, it's basically like sort of a the past, like remembering the past and trying to stitch it back together, um, especially if you're doing something like Ready Player One. Like, of course, you're going to draw on big cultural um, tokens that people recognize. Right, yeah. But um, it's sort of like like a show like Stranger Things. I. You know, I would like to know, and I mean, maybe people have talked about this, but I'd really like to know how many people watch that show from who were like that age or even a little older. Right, yeah. Like, uh, you know, in the in the 80s. And if they if the show wouldn't have some uncanny valley like like effect upon yeah. them, if they wouldn't be kind of weirded out because there's this facsimile or this this um simulacra. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. Like exactly. there's not this act. There's this copy of a copy like you're trying to re-represent the past but it's also through this very distorted consumerist sort of window that like oh well this song is playing well this show is on tv well they're dressed like this and this and this Mm -hmm. and i mean that's like that's such a good point where like the past is so dematerialized you know like it's separated from any uh, material 
base, I guess, which would be like capitalism, advanced commodity production, and really like the the objects themselves, right, of um of the past, which become subjects really of the past, right? Like all of this media, you know, they're no longer objects, right? They are things that are acting upon us and acting with their own free will almost. But it's like it's like it's dematerialized from like what was actually happening at the time, you know, mm -hmm. like what were various peoples going through? Like what was the what was the curve in the arc of history, I guess. Right. And it's like all that shit is just completely just alienated and just repackaged to you as this nostalgic slop that really doesn't even indict, I guess, the present. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't even indict the present either because, as we see, and the movie does a really good job of doing this, I'm not going to lie, is that, like, I mean, up until the end, is that, like, everybody is subsumed into this world and, you know, is making money, not even to feed themselves, but making money to um, continue to buy stuff in Oasis, mm -hmm. right? Um, because there's nothing out there, you know? It's not even a sense of futurelessness. There's no present even, right? There's no now even, right? There's just this sort of state that they're living in, and the only time that people get to actually be a fulfilled human being is in this artificial virtual world, you know? Right, yeah, like, and that's what um, uh, the, uh, the main character says explicitly in that opening monologue. Like, if it's not eating... Um, or sleeping like essentially everyone is in the oasis all day every day um and like i kind of want to use that as a sort of segue into what we mentioned earlier um with uh the whole idea of the uh the tech visionary um coming in to change the world with some sort of virtual reality thing um now like we said, like Mark Zuckerberg and the metaverse, like that wasn't around in 2018 yet when Ready Player One released. Um, uh, but it it is so like so applicable to what um, to uh, what the movie is really based upon, and it's um, like obviously Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse in his lifetime is never going to be anything close to what we see in the movie. Um, yeah, the yeah. Oasis. Um, like if anything, we are decades and decades away from that sort of like if ever right yeah. right yeah like if ever um uh if uh the sun doesn't swallow us up before then um yeah. uh, but um yeah just like um how in ready player one the oasis is made kind of um from a benevolent side like it like uh james halliday is uh shown to be like just this really um socially awkward like autistic coded um uh genius in tech who just wants to make something that everyone has fun with and then mm. you get the main villain of the movie nolan sorrento who is uh who is uh the businessman who is trying to come in and corrupt it um there's a flashback of when sorrento was just an intern at the oasis company and he's trying to speak to halliday about like how there can be like pay tiers uh, mm -hmm. of of uh of users and he he's interested in making a profit while halliday is just interested in like like the the fun video game aspect like he doesn't even respond to what sorrento said yeah. he just says like hey yeah. this is a great latte you gave me and then he turns back to uh, <laughs> yeah. the computer and um uh whereas someone like mark zuckerberg he is almost a sort of amalgamation of halliday and sorrento he is uh, he is both the socially awkward, weird tech guy, uh, mm -hmm. while at the same time being that um, really uh, just cynical businessman who's just trying to get people to like to get everyone to use his product. Um, and um, I really wish that Ready Player One hadn't come out yet, um, because I would have loved to see how that would have changed things. Uh, yeah. if it had been made after this whole metaverse shit. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, the, the whole, like, uh, I mean, in the movie, like, uh, again, I think, well, I guess I didn't mention this, but I think, um, obviously, in the movie, the the Halliday is sort of like, you know, this 
analog of yeah uh zuckerberg but also people like like there are elements of like steve jobs right mm-hmm. and yeah, elon yeah. musk right and jeff bezos and the way i mean that is like not because these are like um uh, men who become incredibly influential in technology but um also um uh sorry technology but also like um yeah, but they're also, I guess, men who have this vision of the future. That's what I'm trying to say, mm-hmm. right? They're yeah. futurists, right? Yeah. So I think, like, this idea of, like, utopia, you know, is something that, like, uh, that obviously Halliday, this Oasis is a utopia for him. I mean, it's called the Oasis, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that all of these all of these individuals, real-life individuals, real-life counterparts, whether it's Zuckerberg or Bezos um, or even Steve Jobs, I mean Elon Musk especially, like these these are people who think that like for well for Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos for them it's gonna be like the utopia is in space right which is a whole other conversation mm-hmm. right but for someone like Mark Zuckerberg you know um and maybe even in some extent Musk I guess too because he has this whole Neuralink thing yeah um they think that like you know like not even augmented reality right which would like you know be um something as silly as like an Instagram filter, right? You know, but like actually virtual reality, right? Mm-hmm. This complete immersion into like um an alternative or well, not even a representation, but a completely different alternative world. Um I think like for these people like that to them is like hearkening back to like the Silicon Valley like sort of like like 90s like dreams of like the internet and this technology, rather the technology will be used, whether it's the internet or whether it's like, you know, devices that we have, um, it's going to usher in like this new age of like humanity, right? Mm-hmm. Like this, this transhumanism almost, right? Web 3.0. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. And like, you know, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's like kind of genius the way that like, um, I don't say genius, but it's like prophetic the way that the book, um, and I don't know how many details the movie keeps in from the book but just sort of this again as we spoke about this utopia that exists among a dystopia you know Mm -hmm. but like i think that with the metaverse and like what's happening now and like with musk trying to actually build like i mean they're calling it like a spaceship like literally i think it's called starship or something like that his new rocket ship yeah like star link i think st- yes no i'm talking about his actual like he's actually has like a rocket that's not the falcon but like a ship that's oh. like yeah yeah that's okay. kind of well it's called but they're calling it even the terminology is they're not calling it a shuttle right he's called it like starship or something like okay, that right yeah but the point i'm making is that like you know they're trying to like push on us that the future is like now that utopia is possible mm-hmm. right now you know that like and I think that's such like a divergence from like um sort of this pre recession nostalgia and this sort of break in the nineties or the two thousands where maybe two thousands, because the nineties I felt like, you know, maybe I'm mis- maybe I'm remembering again, this is the way I'm remembering the past, right? But it was sort of like I think generally that we were on the cusp of the future. Mm-hmm. Like the future, we were on the bleeding edge. Yeah. And then it's like the two thousands, like man, especially like, you know, nine eleven was the probably like what really set the tone for the century, you know, it was like everything, time just kind of stopped. No, time, no, culture slowed, but time sped up, right? Yeah. And it's like, you know, it, it feels like now there's this sort of like, um, I mean, we could talk about even, I mean, we won't, but like, you know, even political political economy, there's like this crisis of, um, of um, paralysis, you know? And... I think that like these guys are like Halliday trying to like, and they're going to say too that Jeff Bezos like has always wanted to be, and I don't kind of mixing around these people all up, but they're all pretty much the same fucking yeah, guy, right? Yeah, seriously. Like the same tech futurist, bro, right? Like mm-hmm. really low key neo fascist, right? Neo fascist, like futurist fascist, sorry. Like yeah. the actual, the way the fascists meant futurism, right? Italian fascist. But, um, you know, it's like they, they really, they, it, Jeff Bezos, uh, was obsessed with space travel and space exploration, right? When he was like, I guess, a kid, and when he's up into college, like, he literally wanted to turn Earth into like a nature, like a planetary nature preserve, almost. Yeah. And have sp- and have space hotels, right? So like, like Halliday is reaching back into his past, right? 
to bring this utopia, this nostalgic utopia to people in a dystopian present. And these motherfuckers are trying to do the same shit, man. They're just have enough money to live out their boyhood fantasies, except it's, I mean, I've been saying, I made a joke on Twitter that we live in a midstopia, you know, like this is not <laughs> even a cool dystopia. It's just mids as hell because like, yeah. it's like, it's just these rich assholes that just now, not even as Halliday did where I think he like about the film realizes that his dream is being, is, is, is being corrupted. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and has been corrupted after his death by like these uh, malevolent private, you know, capitalistic forces but like, you know, like uh, these guys um, now don't even they even have this veneer of humanism. But really what it is, is they just want to spend their fucking money so they can dick around, you know, whether it's going to the fucking Mars or going to Mars, which is never going to fucking happen. Or like, I mean, not at least by fucking uh, Elon Musk right. or whether it's like Mick Mar- Mark Zuckerberg, Rick. I don't even know because he's so fucking rich that he could reinvent himself in real life. You know what I mean? It's not like virtual reality where you can be anything or anyone. He can already do that. But you get what I'm saying? It's just recreating all of this fucking bullshit, which I have to say, I mean, Halliday at least had more honorable, you know, intentions, I guess. Right. Right. Yeah. And like with Ready Player One, uh, the Oasis, um, while it eventually like ended up becoming the economy of the world you know like like we mentioned like people do things in oasis to get money for the real world at least in the oasis it like it looks like it would really be a fucking awesomely fun time to (laughs) to just dick around in just Mm. like races with king kong or giant like giant battles on an asteroid in space you know like it gets all this really cool shit (laughs) um but then you have uh zuckerberg and his reveal of the metaverse and it's just a bunch of me avatars wandering around an empty grocery store it's like it's like what the fuck it's it's like exactly this isn't fun or even visually interesting it's just uh a shittier version of the world that i already inhabit you know like like instead of actually going to the grocery store and getting things i gotta strap on a headset and pretend to shop in this empty store uh, eventually to just have things delivered to my house ostensibly later instead of just actually going to the store and having it right then, you know? Um, yeah. And like with Zuckerberg himself, like he, yeah. like he doesn't really even want to reinvent himself. He has always seen himself like at least aesthetically as a sort of like Roman emperor, the way he wears his hair, the, the screenshot mm-hmm. of his like new avatar that he released, like after the initial, metaverse release and everyone was like this looks like shit dude like he yeah he like beauty he beautify he yeah he, it a little yeah, bit yeah man. like he, much he like did. he must have like walked down to that department and just like whipped those guys up and just it's like make me a screenshot of like a roman yeah, market literally. and make a uh a, a, a bust of me essentially in the roman style and and shove that on there and let people know that like no 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 we can still do this you know but obviously like no nobody wants the metaverse um and uh and like i think that um uh that also kind of says some some stuff about the imagination of these self-professed futurists uh at the end of the day it um all this stuff that they're trying to do uh whether it's the metaverse or, or rocket ships to mars or whatever um it is still um trying to be an escape again to, uh, from the world we live in, whether metaphorically, like by wearing a headset and escaping to this future world, or literally physically, like we are leaving the planet. Uh, we're escaping from the shit that we did on Earth. Like it's 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 never going to work. It's going to be like Elon Musk's like uh, like like what was it the like the one shot tunnel or whatever. He yeah. Called it. Yeah. Know. The hyperloop yeah, shit, like, man. Yeah. 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 The hyperloop. Let's put a single lane of traffic into <laughs> an enclosed space and that's going to solve all our problems. I mean, like, man, yeah. like trains, motherfucker, like, you know, I mean? and again, <laughs> oh, right. And again, yeah. like, you know, it's just like, you know, um, I think like the whole, again, the whole like nostalgia thing and, um, um, you know, futurelessness is that like, yeah, nostalgia, like, you know, for, for, for people that, uh, that, are supposed to be uh 
representatives of the future or of a mm-hmm. sort of forward way of thinking, at least like with technology. I mean, like, you know, what essentially it is is a response to futurelessness, right? To mm-hmm. kind of like get people excited about tomorrow, which I mean, you know, I'm not a complete doomer. You know, I do think like I wouldn't ill, so I wouldn't be like, you know, right, a, a yeah. communist. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, like, you know, the left has to sort of form its own um sort of revolutionary culture because i mean essentially what we're talking about is culture here right i mean we're talking about Mm -hmm. this movie i mean you know outside of even i mean it is political but like it's one thing to you know organize um um which i mean obviously is like you know that's that's paramount right but like you know i think like through that organization building like a robust culture that can depict um fair and honest and accurate representations of the past, but they can also imagine a better tomorrow is something that like the left is like, um, you know, I mean, some days I feel like it's sorely lacking. And then other days, like I feel much more positive about, but like, I think the only way to avoid, um, some sort of situation, which ready player, ready player one, you could say that we live in that kind of world now, you know, I mean, we live in this world where, like, we're all connected, you know, via the Internet. We're all tapped into this, like, information highway, this sort of cultural mainframe where, um, you know, like DeBoer talks about in The Spectacle, where the spectacle is not just a sort of representation of social reality, you know, but it even serves as individual individual components of social reality so it's like this totality but it's also this sort of like um this this alienated perspective you know so i mean like we're already kind of in that you know um and i think the only way to sort of i mean there's no really going back that's why i guess at the end of the movie right like uh it 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 couldn't be just log off right like, I can't really just tell people to just log off. I don't think that's even what I'm suggesting, you know. Um, and in the movie, I guess, like, I can understand why, um, if it's unthinkable for me, right, not entirely unthinkable, but just incredibly difficult, then I could only imagine for the people writing it, they can never imagine logging off. And maybe that's not necessarily what needs to happen, but I do definitely think that, like, you know, like, I kind of end my piece with saying that there's no refuge in the past you know Mm -hmm. and um there's this famous quote i think it's from oh man i can't remember is it from arundhati roy i don't remember who it is i don't even know if i'm pronouncing your name wrong sorry if i am but um it's this quote where um you know there's a uh uh there's a better world waiting for us or something like that like i can hear her you know and it's like Mm -hmm. nah dog that's like bullshit too right that's like this utopianism um, and the socialist tendency sort of um, um, definition of it that is, again, dematerialized, right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, you know, it's like we have to make it, you know? And the only way I think that we can do that is like, like, I mean, obviously the organization is a different podcast, but the organizing, but like is imagining a better future, right? And I think that mm-hmm. really comes through through like culture. And that's why I think it's positive. You know, I'm rambling here, but just to kind of finish out, like it's it's important, like, I mentioned in the piece, like, representation, Mm -hmm. you know, um, in media. I mean, one of my favorite, my favorite Star Trek is Deep Space Nine. Um, Yes, yeah. And, yo, it's so, it's so good, right? And it's like, it's because, I mean, um, for me, and I think for, I think for, like, I mean, any black person that watched it, it's because you had this show, it's like, at this point, like, I don't know, back then it was like 40 years old or something like that, 50 years old, something that, like, you know, starred, like, a white guy, various white guys, you know, for the two shows that came before that, but were beloved, right, mm-hmm. for decades by people. And then you have this black guy come in, co- commanding a black station and raising his black son. And, you know, that was like Afrofuturism, right? That was like a depiction of the future, you know, centuries away in which black people had like you know like kind of rose above the bonds of exploitation and subjugation and yeah this is a show about the future but you could even say that about like any um piece of media that does um um 
uh, race bending, right? Where they switch mm-hmm. the race or where they have representation because like, you know, I think for people, this, this especially for young people, like this is about imagining, um, even if it's not consciously, imagining a different society, right? Imagining a better future, right? Um, and not sort of relying on these predominant, predominantly white, cishet, you know, um, male depictions of the past that leave so many people out. Because, I mean, if you can't, if you can't really, if you don't know, I mean, I know this is like a trite phrase to say, but if you don't know your past, then you can't even imagine a future, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I know I've been rambling, but, um, yeah, man, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's why, like, I think, like, I like this movie, you know, because of what my interests are, but it's also, again, very insidious, you know, so I got to, like, take it with a grain of salt, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and, like, like, that's, um, like, that's why I do this podcast, that's why I called it Overcritical, um, mm-hmm. it, it, because, like, especially with a movie like this, like, it's just, it is meant to be a, a fun, visually exciting adventure, um, it, like, I don't think anyone, um, involved in the making of this movie was trying to like make any sort of political statement one way or the other. Um, yeah, definitely not. Uh, but it is still important to like really dive deep into this, uh, this kind of, um, uh, of, uh, storytelling and see what we can learn from it. Um, and, uh, yeah, we may have to be a bit, uh, um, uh, over dramatic, over critical about it, but uh, that's how we learn from it. And um, uh, to uh, your point, uh, um, just about building a better future, um, and uh, like how, like nostalgia really is something that the left has to uh, really grapple with and sort of figure out. Um, uh, I'm reminded of this clip. I cannot remember exactly the context of it but it was um a group of leftists walking through a street in some city again i can't remember where but they were just chanting um stalin mao lenin (laughs) that's all they were doing and yeah it's it's important to learn what we can from these historical figures because they are like incredibly important in the development of the left and leftism but um you can't just make everything about uh like your boy lenin you know like yeah well you can't do what happened like over 100 years ago exactly right? years ago like i mean like that's not you know what i mean that's like the insidious thing about nostalgia mm-hmm. you know i guess it's like um, exactly you know sort of getting i mean becoming inert right i mean like we are already we're already so with such an inert society we're already so paralyzed um and you know not to make it sound all bad i mean i think the left has definitely made some um has made some advances in the past couple of years, surely, but like, yeah, I agree with you, right? Like this sort of like, um, um, this sort of that's why I like you know again Gorbachev dying. Um, I think that it's heartening on the one hand to see people who weren't even born when the Soviet Union, you know, um, fell. You know, I think that it's heartening for them to realize that oh, this is the guy who like sold out the dream, mm-hmm. you know. But at the same time, like. Eh, well, maybe dog. Maybe you don't want to. Maybe you don't want Stalinism. You know, eh, right? There, yeah. There, there are some things I can agree with. There are a lot of things though. I'm not. I'm not about. You know what I mean? So yeah. maybe we should look for a synthesis, right? Or a new way, right? Like, not a third way, Jesus. But you know, something, uh, something else entirely. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, yeah. Maybe the left uh, really should just take every Tuesday and Thursday and just kind of <laughs> figure out where we need to go instead of looking at the past exclusively. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's a good place to, to end our discussion. Um, unless, uh, you had anything else on your mind that, uh, you wanted to make sure you shared. No. Um, the only thing, last thing I'll, uh, I'll say, um, I actually recommend is, um, something that's not even really related to player ready player one, but, um, um, I did recently watch a hauntological show. So, uh, I didn't really talk much about hauntology um, in terms of um, uh, more as like a sort of abstract aesthetic, you know, like I did kind of mention, like, obviously, like uh, uh, Ready Player One and all the Easter eggs for people mm-hmm. that are nostalgic of the 80s. But um, 
Um, there's a show that approaches ontology in a different way, and it's like the what if, right? Um, and it's uh, for all mankind. Um, uh, I'd recommend. Uh, I'm, I'm leaving. I've watched so many, so much fucking TV, man, that uh, my last words are recommending another fucking <laughs> sh- thing for people to watch. But like, I well, think I mean, it's like, in your defense, like I've heard very good things about that show. Oh, dog! It's yeah. so it's so good because basically it's like like it, you know I was talking about ontology is basically sort of um. You know, um, this lost future in this show is about what if the Soviets landed on the moon first? Mm-hmm. And because the Soviets land on the moon first, um, they the whole space race is like, I mean, of course, it's an arms race, but it's even more charged. Right. So, like, you are not only watching a show that is like it, it, it represents the 80s, right, in the 90s in the third season. It represents it in a way that is only vaguely familiar because the whole the events change right because now like countries are spending money on space programs instead of just merely weapons but also technology changes so in the 80s like the late 80s people are using laptops right everyone has a cell phone Mm. right you know what i mean because like space race gave us a lot of these technological you know, things that we take for granted, you know? So, like, it's a hauntological show because... The uh, last thing I'll say, because even though the writers are not socialist, they're not... Le- I don't know, maybe some of them are left or whatever, but... Uh, maybe, but... Yeah, the show is pretty anti-communist, though. They're anti-communist. But, like, the thing is, is that the subtle conceit in the show is that if the Soviet Union lasted, the world would have been a better place in some regards. Mm-hmm. And uh, maybe the newest season will change that because maybe. But the point is that it's a very hauntological show and it's a very what if show. It's a very lost future show. And if you just want to see the Soviet Union rocking past 1990, it's a pretty cool show to watch. So I'd recommend that. If people like Ready Player One. Yeah. Um, I I love like uh, speculative historical fiction like that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I um, especially like it when it's not uh, something about if the nazis won because that's yes that's that's always the first thing people go to and like yeah that's a big deal but like there's other shit that you can explore so yeah yeah, yeah did yeah. you hear did you hear uh last thing did you hear real quick i'm happy it got canceled but um the game of thrones brothers i don't know their fucking names but um they had a show actually that was called confederate that was supposed to come out which was like yes bro an alternate for the listeners an alternate history oh where this God. uh where the south wins the civil war and it's like it's the same kind of problem with like, well, if the Nazis won World War Two, well, I mean, they kind of fucking did, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> because we just subsumed all of that. They got their shit from us partially, and then you know we just took all of that. And it's the same thing with like you know the North quote beating the South. So it's like, right? Yeah, yeah like, it's it, yeah. It, like the South still like won in some in some regards uh very big regards yeah right? so yeah. like we don't need a whole show about like if they like really won in air quotes yeah oh we'd have a lot of black people doing uh, uh doing free labor and um um without having any <laughs> freedom of mobility i think that's fucking calling incarcerate mass incarceration dog like, yeah you know what i mean yeah oh my god imagine that oh man i yeah, can't even exactly, imagine exactly. living in a future like that oh exactly, yeah exactly. yeah two of some of the most least qualified people to tackle a topic like that i'm glad that show got canceled uh yeah me, before me it even started too. yeah and me fucking too <laughs> Um, yeah, so Aaron, where can people find you and uh, your stuff? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, uh, first of all, people can find me at Twitter on Borg Posting. Um, this is like, I don't know, man, my sixth or seventh and last account. I'm not doing this <laughs> shit again. Um, that's Borg Posting, another Star Trek reference, B O R G Posting. And, um, yeah, people can check me out on the Trillbillies, Trillbilly Workers Party. Um, everybody loves communism and especially everybody loves communism. We're trying to get more, um, patrons and just listeners with patrons, especially that'd be nice. And, um, I just talk with my comrades, Jamie and Jorge about communist theory, about the news. Uh, we just actually, uh, have a new series called lost futures about, um, Mm. science fiction, um, science fiction media, whether it's literature, film or TV, um, even science fiction concepts. And, a uh, struggle session again, which is very similar to this podcast, um, where um, I'm with Leslie and my buddy Jack Allison, and we talk about Star Trek. We talk about comics. I 
uh, there's a Sandman episode, um, Sandman episode that just came out that I wasn't on, unfortunately, because I was in New York. But um, if you like Sandman, you like comics, you like Star Trek, um, go check them out. And uh, yeah, my Substack, I guess, uh, spacelight.substack.com, where I don't write nearly enough, man. So <laughs> I don't, I really don't. I mean, I've re- I re- I feel like I write one piece once a year. You know, that's literally how it's been. So I need a... I think maybe I want to. The next thing I want to do is write about for all mankind and continue on this hauntological tip because that show is the last show that I've watched to completion. I'm watching the Expanse now, but um, mm. uh, for all mankind, definitely as a communist um, and as like a, a space nerd, um, it's very good. So uh, thank you so much for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for coming on. Uh, you overcritical listeners out there, make sure you go follow uh, him on Twitter. True Billies. Everybody loves communism. Struggle session. Uh, but yeah. Um, thanks for listening and we'll see y'all next time.